So, some connections in culture and um, open source. So I'm going to make a very, very long uh, detour and try to come back to software at the end. Um, just a, a brief background of myself. So I'm, I'm CEO for MariaDB Corporation. Um, and uh, I, as many other people from Finland, worked for Nokia for a very, very long time. Uh, there are very many fewer people working for Nokia nowadays, but uh, it's been a very valuable experience for many uh, on the way. And I wanted to trace um, some thoughts around community and collaboration to maybe Nordics is, is a broad concept. Perhaps Finland is more specific in this case. You know, what might some of the sort of underlying cultural traits uh, of this all be? And I think one way to look at it is, is to go back to the climate and the environment. Um, Nordic countries, cold, uh, fairly harsh environment, perhaps not the first, most fertile land. So for some strange reason, some people settled there a long time ago. Now, the people that settled there must have been fairly persistent, stubborn, um, not giving up uh, in the face of some, some major obstacles. And I think that probably is a useful trait uh, if you're developing uh, new software, new products. And um, in Finland, we have this concept called SISU. Um, and you had heard a lot of interesting words that are difficult to translate already earlier today. I think Lagom is a great one. Finland, probably the equivalent would be Sisu, which is very different from Lagom. Sisu is more like guts and per perseverance. Um, but looking at this picture, which is actually a famous painting, um, uh, describing uh, the, the slash and burn culture or the sort of agriculture model in Finland. I think it shows that when you have a country that still today is covered 70% by forest, actually uh, having farming land takes a lot of effort. And uh, the um, underlying concept here was you have to persevere, persevere hardly and, and, and then also um, the collaboration idea from the very beginning. So I think you heard, we heard this morning a great explanation of talkot this idea of collaborating, working together, uh, especially it was necessary to be able to survive in those days. Equally um, interesting idea from Finland is, uh, is the sauna. Um, now, today, sauna is sort of like a spa. It's a luxury place where people go, go to enjoy themselves. But um, I don't think many people knew that this was the, 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 the first home that most people built for them up until the end of the 20th, 19th century. Um, some people still build saunas when they have summer cottages. It's the only building they have. Um, so until the First World War, most Finns were born in a sauna. Um, I think another interesting statistic, though, is that in the 1970s, there were more saunas per capita in Finland than there were bathrooms per capita in the UK. Um, <laughs> I guess it's because we did more in the sauna uh, than perhaps Brits, Brits would do in the UK. So they were very, very sort of multi-purpose environments. People lived in them. But it's also grown into a cultural element which, which extends a lot beyond the initial purpose. And um, I think it's fair to say up until the 1990s, most really essential business negotiations, political negotiations, and diplomatic negotiations were held in a sauna. And, and one reason why they're no longer held there is that, um, of course, now you have much more uh, equality between men and women. And it's inconvenient to have to finalize those negotiations there because we have a very large proportion of, of key decision makers in all these fields that are women. Um, and, and that goes back to some of the, the key cultural aspects of sauna is that you do have mixed saunas, but only when you're in family or in student parties. Um, and. Um, Interestingly, all new business offices in Finland still have a sauna, either in the basement or on the, uh, on the top floor in the penthouse. And, and they are used, but often now they come in duplicates. So you have men's and ladies separately, uh, as, as you have in many other aspects as well. So sauna is very important. You do learn a lot of, uh, of communal aspects uh, from a young person. And I think the whole history shows that these buildings were built collectively between different families helping each other out. A next step in, in understanding Finnish culture and you know, what, what, bring, what makes us perhaps uh, persistent um, is, is related to the Second World War. I just wanted to ask which countries in Europe were not occupied by a foreign uh, force during the Second World War? Sweden. Sweden? Wales. Wales? <laughs> Extrapolating most of the UK. <laughs> Uh, and Finland. Now, um, you know, Finland does have a border of over a thousand kilometers with what was the Soviet Union at the time. So, uh, I think one of the aspects of, of Sisu as well, and 
and this sort of spirit of collaboration is it, the amazing way in which Finland was able to avoid being occupied during the Second World War. Very few countries, and especially none of the other uh, you know, countries with such long borders to the Soviet Union were, were as, uh, got off as easily. But that, that was sort of, it, it wasn't easy. There was a lot of hard work, a lot of fighting, a lot of seesaw, um, both on the uh, battlefield and in diplomacy. And, and I think the diplomacy has continued up until this day. It's interesting to see the, the sort of nature of dialogue regarding the Ukraine crisis in Finland and the sensitivities that we have, you know, the hi whole history of how to stay neutral here. Uh, Sweden has, has, has always had a neutral history, but for Finland it's been a lot more tricky to maintain that balance. But again, you know, it shows some aspects of the, the grit and perseverance that were needed to survive. And, and another sort of element which I think is necessary for the emergence of open source software um, is the education system. Now, I'm sorry about these pictures. In, in, in true uh, sort of scrappy style, I pu pulled these off uh, Google image search in, at the last minute. So this isn't, the resolution isn't, isn't great. But I think there's been a lot of talk about the Finnish education system over the, the last 20 years. And um, a lot of wondering as to why um, it, it, it's been fairly good. Of course, in the last few years, the Korea and, and, and Shanghai and Hong Kong and a few other places have, have gone beyond Finland. Uh, they've learned their lessons and, and copied and stole with pride. Um, and I think the one thing which, which is a, a common factor is that teachers have always been held in very high regard in Finland. Uh, they may not have the highest salaries, but you have a lot of young people that aspire to be teachers when they're big. Uh, when they grow up. And, and, and Finland had a, an extremely high literacy rate already at the end of the 19th century. Um, and uh, I think that certainly is, is a factor that this sort of universal education system and the whole universal social security, the whole Nordic social model uh, has allowed for having an environment where there are a lot of people that are well educated, um, you're well taken care of, so you have, uh, you know, maternity uh, benefits are very generous, you have childcare, free schooling, free healthcare, everything is well taken care of. And if you look at, so there's this, um, this research done, um, this is a, a, an institution, Ingelhardt Wetzel, um, I don't know if you can see, but up in the, in the right-hand side you have this sort of Protestant Europe, so you have uh, Sweden, the, the Nordic countries, a bit of Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, Iceland, and then, uh, you know, towards the left, uh, and and the, the horizontal axis is, is around, you know, survival versus self-expression. It's, it's some criteria they've used, and then traditional versus secular rational values. Now, I don't want to make this into a religious discussion, but uh, there's some aspect of here, the, 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 the culture in these countries, uh, which is made for a fertile environment, well-educated people with a bit of, uh, you know, the freedom not to have to only defend for themselves, and an inherent culture of collaborating together to get things done. Um, and if you look at, at sort of where, what has happened uh, in, in that context, uh, it has created a positive environment for, for collaborative projects in many different regards. Um, and and a, a, another area which is interesting is, is around music. This is a, a picture of three famous Finnish um, artists, I could say. There's a, a painter, a, a poet, and, and a composer. Composer is on the right, Sibelius. Um, they enjoyed uh, drinking together. Um, in fact, there's an anecdote that they were drinking in this, uh, the Kemp Hotel, which is uh, a luxury hostel, hotel still today. And um, at some stage, Sibelius had to go and conduct a concert in Paris. So he was gone for two weeks. And when he came back, the others were wondering why he didn't serve the previous round of drinks. Um, so, but, but there was, a, the, these were all, a lot of, the, the whole cultural emergence of Finland in the beginning of, uh, uh, of the 20th century was, was driven strongly by arts. And, and uh, even today, um, from the 1970s, there's been uh, music institutions across the country and, and just an amazing amount of conductors and opera singers and, and symphony orchestra that are absolutely world class coming out of Finland. Totally disproportionate. Uh, and I think some people attribute to that to the fact that there, is so many, there are so many symphony orchestras and choirs in Finland that are a mix of professionals and, and amateurs. That it's just a, a very good environment for practicing conducting, for example. In very few countries do you have, as, as a conductor, if you're training to be a conductor, do you have the possibility to be conducting several different symphony orchestras every week. Uh, in a good environment. And again, this sort of idea that a lot of people, it's a hobby on the one hand, but people actually uh, are there and they enjoy uh, spending the time together, doing these projects together, very much a collaborative effort in that regard as well. And I did want to, want to sort of address, you know, how does one tie in uh, the success of, of Nokia's and Ericsson's in all of this? And, and is there anything in common uh, with what we've spoken about earlier? Um, <coughs> 
horrible graphics again, sorry about that. These are different generations of mobile telecommunications. And I think we all know about GSM and 3G and, and, and those which are global standards. But what not everybody recognizing is that um, the GSM standard emerged largely in a very collaborative fashion because of work that had happened in the Nordic countries in the 1980s. So the first generation NMT, uh, Nordic Mobile Telecommunications, was a standard that was only used in the, in the Nordic countries and, um, and Benelux in, in, in a few places. Um, at the time, in the 19, late 1980s, there were competing standards in the UK, with tax in, in, the, U, in the US, with amps, and in, in, in Japan, obviously, as well. And, and uh, Nokia and Ericsson in those days were by no means global uh, players, uh, but they realized that in order to succeed in this market, you had to work together to create a standard. Because if, if Finland had their own standard and Sweden had their own standard, then nothing would become of that. And I think it's fair to say that the re one of the main reasons why we have, um, we can all travel around the world to almost any country and just switch on your mobile phone and, and call anywhere, um, is because of that standardization work that started very early on around uh, GSM and then later 3G and, and all the evolutions of it. And, and that collaborative culture was really seeded in the Nordics with Nokia and Ericsson realizing that they needed to work together to create a standard that could then become a commercial business. And they were, of course, competing uh, in, in a bloody fashion with each other and with others as well later on. Um, but there was a sort of cross-licensing of uh, IP, which is essential to having these standards work. And I see a lot of similarities there, the idea that you're working together, creating broad adoption around something which you can then compete within, you know, you're creating a big pie and you find your slice of that pie, but if you start you know, over-optimizing something which is proprietary too early on, then it's never going to become standardized more widely. So in that sense, they're, they're definitely, although Nokia and Ericsson perhaps were not examples of open source companies, in itself, uh, I think the way they work together uh, set a lot of uh, precedents for that. Now, of course, if you look at the, the LAMP stack, um, three of the four letters have Nordic roots. So Linux, uh, MySQL, and PHP all had Nordic creators. And, um, and since then, in true open source forking style, uh, I think now you could almost say that it's like the LN. MP, uh, no, e Nginx is, is pretty much taking over Apache in most environments, and MariaDB is now the default in, 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 in most Linux uh, stacks as well. And Python, PHP, there's many pearls and others coming into that category. So the good thing is that these evolve, and, and these standards evolve and, and live further and find new ways of, of moving uh, to become, uh, find the space and adapt to, to the opportunities available. It's just interesting to look at these stats of this sort of number of contributors per capita uh, in different countries to Debian. Um, and you know, many of those countries, Martinique is a bit of an, an interesting one up there, but uh, many, of the, many of the others were in that top right hand corner of a chart I showed earlier. Um, so you know, there, there are some aspects of culture which would be interesting to look into. Uh, I think Debian is probably one of the, the more uh, sort of community driven of, of the projects available and very broad, broad number of contributors as well. The other interesting aspect with, with open source is just uh, you know, James's uh, introduction around MySQL. Um, when startups get acquired by large companies, the founders often leave. But when open source project gets acquired by large companies, uh, you can fork. And uh, you know, one thing which happened uh, early on uh, in, in, in many of these projects is that you have multiple different forks emerging. And there's this spirit of, of being the underdog. So which of these boats belongs to Larry Ellison? <laughs> the guy in the little dinghy is David Axmark, who's one of the three founders of MySQL. And this picture was taken in Stockholm Harbor um, about 10 years ago. Um, I think it sort of illustrates um, where the money is being spent, let's say. Um, and uh, so, you know, the MariaDB project started emerging after Oracle acquired Sun. Monty left uh, in one direction with a bunch of developers. He was really scared of losing many of the developers in all different directions. Uh, and then another company called SkySQL was founded in 2010 um, by a lot of people that were more focused on services and sales. And SkySQL was selling services to a lot of MySQL users initially. And MariaDB and SkySQL merged together uh, in 2013. And MariaDB's uh, success since 2012 has been pretty phenomenal. Um, so today we have over 2 million downloads. Um, MariaDB is embedded in all the Linux distributions, and it's the default 
in Fedora, uh, CentOS, Red Hat, RHEL, um, OpenSUSE, and, and SLES as well. Um, we have lots of paying customers, and, and we have strategic partnerships with many of these large players. I think it's, it's fair to say that you know, MySQL is adopted in, in lots of key enterprise architectures, and um, many of these large enterprise players have difficult relationships with Oracle. So as MariaDB has emerged in this space, we have a lot of uh, suitors when it comes to large IT players and, and, and others. So um, over the last year, our focus was heavily on, on the uh, Linux environment. We've been working hard to build these relationships, and we're now working closely with, with these uh, various teams. And we're now focusing increasingly on, on the cloud stacks. So we're already working closely with, with Rackspace, and, and uh, Pivotal has adopted MariaDB in uh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, we're now in discussions with uh, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, a lot of the others to see how we can, at the right moment, in the right way, introduce MariaDB into those cloud stacks. And uh, our objective, obviously, is over time to make sure that MariaDB really is the best database for cloud and for software as a service. So we've invested a lot of money in, in enabling scaling and replication. Um, also, interoperability. I think if you look at what's happened in databases over the last five years, you have hundreds of new NoSQL players emerging with very compelling propositions of scaling and uh, ease of use and, and so forth. But um, most applications still have transactional needs. Um, we see that the market is heavily dominated by the proprietary databases, and we're out there to really disrupt that market uh, on the cloud uh, with these large partners to drive true open source in, into the enterprise stacks on the database side as well. So we're building further partnerships and, and developing on this whole environment. The company is, is sort of like an open source project in that we're virtually spread around the world with 80 employees in 15 different countries. We only have an office in Finland, a very small one, um, but the company is heavily uh, based on these core Finnish values. If you look at um, the sort of CISO underdog thing, it, I think Finns are always better when they're number two or number three. Uh, when they become number one, it, it's a bit scary almost. Um, and, and the collaborative spirit lives strongly here. Um, we're really looking to build a very strong community. Uh, what we're also doing, though, is, is seeking how to build this sort of pre-competition collaboration. Uh, you know, how can we work together with those others that have shared interests uh, to build a strong adoption, build strong relevance around the technology, so that when the time comes for really reaping the rewards, then you can have a strong, strong position to start off with. So just some thoughts, culture, Finland, open source software, uh, some of the backgrounds on that. Thank you. Questions? Oh,